Welcome to the Health Enthusiasm Podcast, a panel discussion on behaviors, innovations, and trends in health and self-care. My name is Christophe Choquet. I am the author of the book called Health Enthusiasm and a global keynote speaker on the future of health and self-care business. Every month, I discuss with a panel of experts the positive changes that are shaping our health and happiness. Today, we are having, calling in from Barcelona, is our digital health connector, Aline Noiset. Hola. Our American in Paris and medical expert in digital health, Aditi Joshi. Hey, everyone. And we also have from Ghent, Belgium, human experience expert, Mo Zouina. Hello. This means that we are missing this time, this episode, our customer experience and research expert from London, Krupa Sutar. Last episode, we tried to reach the absent panelists, but that didn't quite work out that well. If you want to know what I'm talking about, just go back and listen to the previous episodes. So this time we decided to invite a guest. It's um, a frolic of mine and friend, I may say, with whom I, I like to uh, discuss a lot. He used to call himself the pharma provocateur because he really wants the pharma and the healthcare business in general to be more ambitious and more creative. He calls himself the, an, a noisy introvert, if you look at his LinkedIn page. And I'm really looking forward to discussing things with him today. The more even, because this episode is always recorded in the morning, and he told me that he is very grumpy in the morning. I'd like to welcome to you Paul Sims. Welcome, Paul. What an introduction. Thank you very much. Great to be here. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, together we will amplify the health enthusiasms that we see in articles, in new business ventures, or simply even in the world around us. Now, if you're new to the show, you might wonder what health enthusiasm is all about. Well, health enthusiasm is the aspiration that we all have to be healthy and happy. And as a result of this, every company or organization is now more than ever focused on making their customers healthy and happy. So tell me, Aline, uh, what health enthusiasm did you witness in the past month? Health enthusiasm that I, I witnessed and I liked a lot is coming from the state. And it's a startup who is turning the laundromat, so the place where we go to, to wash our clothes, into doctor's office. So people are going to those places every weekend to, to wash their clothes. And they spend two hours there waiting for the clothes to be to, to dry. And those same people often, they don't have time to go to the doctor's office. So that startup called Fabric Health, they go there every week. They sit down with the people and they can help them to, to get a, a cancer screening, to have their, their blood pressure tested, or even to have them their health insurance. So the company, for instance, did a partnership with a hospital. And one weekend, they brought a mammogram like on the, on the truck. And so some women could do their, their screening on, on the spot. And they also did a partnership with an insurance company to help the people there to, to subscribe to insurance company, to understand how it works, to, to make the most of it. And I really like that, uh, that news because I think it's really bringing the care where the people are. And some people normally not accessing healthcare were missing on screening, on prevention. They can access healthcare. So I think it's a great, great initiative. Yeah, I totally love it. And actually, it's, um, there's a lot happening in that space because, I mean, we've been suffering two, three years. We're living in a pandemic and healthcare delivery was actually under pressure. And I think th those are one of the solutions that, um, that maybe can help things, right? And even my, my health enthusiasms are in that same area. I'm talking about flying care or uh, it's actually a, a company that was founded by flying whales. And if you think about whales, you might quickly understand that it is about zeppelins because what they are building, it's not yet on the market, but what they are building is a zeppelin as a hospital to actually deliver healthcare as well in a more flexible way. I think the existing health infrastructure is, is not really sustainable. It's not really flexible. It's not really smart, not really adaptable, but being able to fly to the areas that is in need could be isolated areas or areas that have a, um, a lot of patients at the same time, which we lived also during the pandemic, well, those zeppelins can actually go there and treat the patients as needed. And it's something that we've seen pretty much everywhere. I think in Qatar right now, this, um, there was this one hospital, maybe you've heard of it. This, it's called, I'm, I'm reading it from my papers here, Al Dayan Health District. It's, it's very interesting because it's a hospital which is not built vertically, but horizontally. They only have two floors. The first floor is the clinical facilities. On the ground floor, you have the beds 
which are always organized in a square. In the middle of the square, you have the gardens and the courtyards. And underneath, there's a circular system where people and the medication and the staff can actually navigate. It's modular, so it's flexible, so it, they can adapt it according to what's happening out there, whether there's a pandemic going on. So a lot of health enthusiasm when it comes to healthcare delivery. Um, Aditi, what did you see as health enthusiasm uh, recently? Well, I was just going to comment first that that Fabric Health is based in Philadelphia, where I used to live, and the hospital they're partnering with is the hospital I used to work at. So, small world. Well, I was going to bring up, it's been the American uh, Telemedicine Association, it's been Telehealth Awareness Week. So, there's a lot of news and a lot of uh, information and education going out there. But what I was particularly interested in, there is a startup called Zocalo Health. It is a virtual healthcare service that's going to be specifically for Latino patients. Uh, They raised $5 million in seed funding, which is great news because there's still a big gap in healthcare access, even though telehealth was supposed to be able to help with that. And so here we are trying to actually improve health equity. It's going to roll out in three states to start out with, but it's a step in the right direction for trying to decrease some of the gaps that are already existing. Um, lovely. Uh, thank you for that. Paul, as a guest, I'll give you the, the word. What's your health enthusiasm? What did you see in the, the recent months? Very kind. Thank you. Um, I enjoyed a report I saw from Medidata. It's obviously a, a vendor in the clinical trial space and needs to be taken, therefore, with a, a pinch of salt. But Digital clinical trials, decentralized trials, obviously full of hype, full of noise. I even wrote myself on <clears throat> LinkedIn a short while ago. I wrote, DCTs are like teenage sex. Everyone talks about it. Nobody actually does it. Everyone thinks everyone else is doing it. So everyone else claims they're doing it. It's exactly one of those type of situations. This report actually dug beneath the hype and determined uh, in Europe, certainly, there were a lot of changes that were happening on the ground and noticeably so for patients in this field of clinical trials, which of course is so important for, for everything that we do. And not only was the technology being significantly adopted across a majority of trials, it was actually having measurable benefits to the patients underneath as well. So I thought it was a a vote of confidence that that, that it's not all hot air and there are uh, genuine changes being made that hopefully will make patients' lives easier as well as making trials more diverse and inclusive, which is one of the great promises and hopes of using more technology in this area. Exactly. And it, it's nice to see because there's, there's a lot of talks about digital health. So it's, it's nice to see that there's some positive news coming in again and that we can very, be very hopeful of uh, what it could bring. Mo, tell me, what health enthusiasm did you see? Well, I was uh, enthusiastic about the fact that I've noticed an initiative in Australia that goes, you know, helps to put the most important thing about care is the transfer of information, right? So, of care is in the transfer of information, but when you're in pain, you can usually tell someone about it. And it goes, it's about pain assessment. Momentarily, the carer is there to assess the pain and is, you know, relying on the subjective information that is received by, or that is sent out by the patient. But for people with communication difficulties, that's not always an option, meaning pain often goes undetected, misinterpreted or wrongly treated. And to give a voice to those who can't really report their suffering, such as people with dementia, there's an organization called Pain Check, an Australian startup that has gone beyond the startup status and has developed an app that uses facial analysis and artificial intelligence to assess score pain levels. So the carer just records a short video of the subject's face using a smartphone and answers questions about their behavior, movements, and speech. And the app's AI recognizes facial muscle movements that are associated with pain and combines this with the carer's observation to calculate an overall pain score. Now, they're not just starting. eh? According to Pain Check, they can detect pain with over 90% accuracy, and they've already assessed more than 100 80,000 pain assessments with worldwide over 66,000 people. And it was now designed for use with elderly people needing care, but you could also use that for infants, for instance, right, where the communication isn't there. Now, it is classified as a medical device in Europe and Australia and Canada and is offered to care homes as a monthly subscription for about $4 per resident. The WHO estimates around 50 million people globally have dementia and there are nearly 10 million new cases every day. And I have a quiz for you, panel. 
There's a 2012 study that estimates the percentage of people living in nursing nursing home that regularly experience pain. Any idea how much people living in nursing homes experience regular or chronic pain in percentage? Any idea? Paul? It's one of those things that you know is going to be higher. You're never right. You You're never right. No. <laughs> if you hadn't have given me that little preamble, I probably would have said... 20 or 30%. I'm sure that that's a wild underestimate. Aline, I saw you nodding. Any idea? I would have said like 70%. Yeah. Aditi? No idea. Come on, Aditi. You've got you to gotta be willing to... Uh... I'll say 60%. I'll say that. <laughs> okay. I'll go all in. They all have pain, probably. They all have pain. I think Aline was, was the closest. I saw her nodding, so she had some affinity with it. It's 80%. Now, what's interesting is that the... Australian government already allocated 5 million Australian dollars for care homes in the country to adopt pain check as a part of a two year trial this year. And they have demonstrated, you know, clinically to be a valid and reliable instrument to assess the presence and severity of pain in people with moderate to severe dementia living in aged care. And they are now starting to assess it, the, the reliability in infants. So. Really, really interesting, a subjective condition that is now objectivized with technology. So uh, really enthusiastic and maybe a bit long winded about this. But anyway, you know, that's how enthusiastic I was. No, I think it's very valuable because, as you say, pain is anyhow very subjective. And so if we could make it a little bit more objective, then definitely this could bring a lot of support to anybody and not just elderly or, or, or kids or people that have difficulty expressing themselves. Um, so I think it's really, it's a nice health enthusiasm. Uh, thanks for that, Mo. Maybe there was, I guess, one more, Aline, that you saw coming from Belgium. Is that correct? From your country, exactly. Yes, I find very interesting to see that in Belgium that the, the psychiatrist or psychologist they can prescribe visits to the museum for the people suffering from mental health. I think it's very interesting, and, and we've heard about that, and also art, like having a positive impact on people suffering from, from mental health. So yes, I think it's a great news. Plus, I guess, a good opportunity to visit your, your national piece of art, right? Exactly. And I, and I remember in one of our first episodes that we did, Aditi mentioned that for her, being in good health or being happy means also going to visit art. So I think this is definitely one of the things that people need to do more. It's also an initiative that um, I wrote about in the book already in 2018 that was happening in Canada and also in New York. And the funny thing about the article that you shared was that they were showing a famous statue in Belgium, which is called Monica Piss, which is a small kid peeing. Uh, it's very famous and you always see people taking pictures of it. So it, it was a it was a funny article to read, definitely with the picture in front. So yeah, it is a health enthusiasm world indeed. Thank you for all these examples. There are so many positive changes that are making our world a little healthier and happier every day. I personally really enjoy watching these changes and faults and I even analyze them and try to understand them and definitely the broader impact that they might bring. I even write a newsletter about it called It's a Health Enthusiasm World. If you're interested, go and discover them on Health Enthusiasm. Now, every month during the Health Enthusiasm podcast, I'll recap one particular newsletter for the panel to debate. Let's get into it. And this week, or this month, this episode, it's about the disease paradigm. Look, when I speak, I often talk about the future. It's not that I um, predict the future, but I love to study change. And from that change, I try to create future scenarios. And one of those potential future scenarios would be that these diseases will become largely irrelevant. And I have about five to six arguments for the panel to debate why this will actually be happening. The first one is purely mathematic. First of all, more people are occupied with their health, even when they're not sick, than there are actually patients. So basically, the, the people are outnumbering patients. And so the focus on prevention is already, and health management in general, is already a lot higher. So there's a lot more opportunities to talk about prevention than sick care. That makes diseases already less relevant. A second one is that prevention is actually a lot more generic. Sick care, that's very specific, right? But prevention is a very generic and you can actually talk about it to anybody, which makes it as a, somebody who puts out solutions more interesting. So you could imagine that if you put out a, a solution for prevention, you will reach a lot more people, which makes it in, more interesting to create, but also it makes it easier to scale, to learn 
and to make your product grow. So prevention will be a lot more important. And this is also what we see in multiple different industries right now. Uh, last episode, we talked about the car industry and how Hyundai and Mercedes-Benz are actually betting on prevention with their what's what was it what was it called again the health car checkup there's also pharma companies that are partnering with wellness apps all around the world basically our houses are built more and more to help us manage our health there are sport brands that support women in their cycle and there's a ton of other examples out there managing your health is becoming ubiquitous. And that's what basically healthism is all about, of course. But we also see it when we look at health startups. They are becoming, bit by bit, less disease-specific. In the first episode, we talked about metabolic health. And this is one of the things that we see everywhere. Metabolic health is not specifically targeting one specific disease, but it's actually helping you to become healthier overall. The whole women's health startup scene is not specifically or not always focused on one particular disease, but they look at, at it from a broader perspective, women's health in general. Um, they are managing or helping with PMS, fertility, PCOS at the same time. And that's specifically because diseases are less, uh, less relevant. Good health is also more important than not being sick. And this is something that we've seen during the COVID periods, where people at a certain moment in time began to realize that their mental health was way more important than just, you know, fighting against that disease or avoiding to be, to become ill. Um, I'm not going here against or any COVID measures whatsoever, but there was a reluctancy out there to just follow them because they felt that they were doing their overall health damage by just staying at home, by just not going out, by just not meeting people. The risk to become ill was actually less relevant than good health overall. And then finally, as a final argument why diseases are becoming re less relevant, is science and technology. Vaccines are becoming more important, definitely with what we've discovered recently. You can expect that a lot of vaccines will come out that will avoid diseases to actually have an onset. There are more and more diagnostic tools. And even the focus on aging that we're having in multiple industries, the whole longevity um, startup scene is not focusing on health from a disease point of view, but is looking to target aging. And when you target aging, you realize that very often diseases originate from one particular thing that you can solve if you prevent them. So that's basically in a nutshell what the newsletter was about, saying that there's a lot of things happening, about six to seven evolutions that we see happening, which bit by bit could make diseases become less relevant. And I'd love to hear from the panel. What's your thought? And let's just start with our medical amongst her in our midst. Aditi, what's your thought on this? You shouldn't just start it with me. I'm going to say that I absolutely agree with prevention. Obviously, we need to do better prevention and vaccines, the COVID measures, all of that is something that works. But I work in medicine. Disease, diseases are relevant. They exist. We have to name them also. So just because we want more preventive care does not mean sick care will go away. In general, when we look at like the way that research has worked, when we don't name diseases, when we don't look at diagnosis, there are entire populations. We talk about women, there's racial disparities in things that we diagnose. And when we don't, again, name diseases, those people get left out. So if we look and say, okay, we're going to move past this and we're going to look at it only as how do we stay healthy, we're going to continue to have those equitable differences. And then in general, like if you don't, label something, you have to remember that you can label the disease because when you label the disease, then it doesn't label the patient. For example, you can say that somebody is diabetic or you can say that somebody has diabetes. You name the disease because then it doesn't label the person that way and we do have to actually treat it. Tech will help us improve that. Obviously, I work in telemedicine. I absolutely want more remote healthcare. I want more preventive disease. I want more monitoring from home. But I want that and then the hospitals still become places where there is sick care and so that we can use it more efficiently. That's what I see happening. And the last thing, I think just talking about metabolic health and using tech, we can have better research with it. But honestly, that's like a place of privilege. There are people who can use that. There are people who are doing that. But, you know, I don't practice medicine for that, just that population. I practice it for everybody. 
And we are leaving out an entire group of people from many, many biases when we say that. So no, I don't agree with that. Okay, interesting. Paul, I see you want to jump in. Obviously, I agree with the DC that diseases need to be named. They need to be called out and marginalized populations in particular, as you said, require that. But I did enjoy your article, Christoph, a lot. I thought that pointing out that prevention is more generic is key. But I don't think that means that prevention is necessarily less named or less defined because the truth is that the reason why prevention hasn't been invested in, as with any prevention, you know, whether it comes to preventing flooding in the world, is that we're very reluctant to pay for it until it happens. We're reactionary animals. And the more that we can define a name and, as Aditi said, use technology to assist with that process, the more it becomes an investable activity, the more it becomes something that you can actually put your efforts into. And the the truth is that more than 90% of investment goes into sick care and disease care today. That's obviously not going to disappear overnight. And any shift towards a more uh, pre or preventative uh, world is, I think, going to be a very smart thing. And all of the clinical studies that be uh, done in this area support that. It's not that prevention is cheap, it's that it's undefinable and that technology is going to help us to define it. Already, the big tech companies, as we all see every single day, the Apples, Pelotons, and Fitbits of the world, see the incredible opportunity of preventative healthcare just by getting you to sign up for their wellness services. They also make it seem a bit sexy, a lifestyle choice, a a, a way of almost um, differentiating yourself and putting yourself into that sort of upper echelon of go-aheader type people by having your Peloton bike. So, you know, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. We want, I wish health was sexier. Unfortunately, it isn't. I wish it was more desirable. Unfortunately, it isn't. I think that that has a place. But what we're starting to see now is specific technology measurements, you know, ways of quantifying preventative care, ways of quantifying and measuring what it actually means and what the actual value of that then leads to. And that, I think, will provide the key difference. So generic, yes, unmeasurable, no. It's also hard to do clinical trials on preventive care. That's the problem too. It's easier on sick care. And so then you don't have the stats to support it, unfortunately, even though we all know that would save us both money, population and health. Absolutely. Yeah. You mentioned diabetes and you mentioned metabolic health. I think one of the things that I'm wondering where I see this um, scenario perhaps happening is Will we as a population, I'm not talking about the medical community, but as a population, as people, not necessarily as patients, be more focused in general on metabolic health than on diabetes per se? And obviously people will still develop diabetes and then indeed it needs to be labeled. The question is, will the effort and the focus that we put in be more on metabolic health and less on the disease in itself? That's basically the underlying question that I'm asking here. I heard the word sex here. That immediately brings me to Mo. You always say that, um, not personally. Not Thank personally, you very much. Uh, I think we'll close up here. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I know that you want to you want to make health and healthcare in general sexier. It should it should almost be as sexy and attractive as the luxury uh, business, right? Well, I was looking at Adine first because you said. But anyway, thanks for landing with me. Yeah, I think we could we could spend an entire podcast on just that one subject, but I'll try and be more to the point. I am a health optimist, but I'm a behavioral realist. As long as human behavior is part of the equation, it's going to be a tough one. I do agree that potentially, you know, that market, as you say, is way more generic, it's way larger. And I think that's why a lot of venture capitalists and startups go there because there's more potential, there's more scale. But we must not forget that we have uh, an affinity, uh, we have an, a bias to negative news, right? So the way w- our agency, the way we react is more on negative than something positive. And as Aditi said, you know, how do you measure success in prevention? I did an HPV campaign once and that physician could never say, you're still living because I, I gave you that vac- you know, I gave you that, that vaccination, that HPV vaccination. So the physician and the service is not in the loop. And by the way, you know, you can only define prevention if you define disease, right? So it's a kind of a dual thing. But I think we're not reinventing the wheel. We're not reinventing the wheel. Why? Because 3,000 years ago, 
the physician in the physicians in China or the traditional medicine was paid for health. You paid the physician to keep you healthy, and then you had to stop paying if you got sick. So there's a business model out there that we're not reinventing the wheel. They did this 3,000 years ago where the physician, you know, the, the village physician was paid, had a contribution to keep everyone healthy. And if someone was sick, you had the right to stop payment, right? So I think we can be inspired by that. And then I do agree with you, Christophe, that diseases will be irrelevant because we'll be working on different pathways. I think we'll be, if you look at Professor Sinclair for the moment, he takes the individual out of the equation and then you'll just be able to take something that you activate to kind of regenerate the processes. I'm, I'm not going into, in, into details there, but his book Lifespan kind of explains that in a very, very interesting way. And maybe, you know, disease and also the intersection between aging and disease is something that we might be able to work on, you know, way earlier and, and way more preventive. So a lot of layers, the human layer, the fact that the, the business model layer, the fact that, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel, the, the business model, the outcomes, paying for health is something that, that was done earlier. Maybe we can pick that back up. Our, our personal bias towards negative and, and the actionability we have towards more negative news and positive news. So layered, complex, hopeful, but we have to stay realist. And I, as Aditi said, technology will, will really help if we take human decision out of the equation. Yeah, interesting. And I think we use the word prevention a lot. I think I have a, another newsletter where I explain where prevention is totally out and that we are more focused on self-care now because prevention is a world that, in, that basically if you're not in the medical community uh, or if you're not avoiding any environmental disasters or fires or whatsoever, this is not a word that we daily use. We're talking about definitely when it comes to our own health, we talk about self-care. And I think that is perhaps more relevant to think of in the sense that how can we make sure that we manage our health better? And this, this is where the health enthusiast trend, health enthusiasm trend comes in. Of course, the focus on self care is to me way more important than just prevention, which comes out of the medical community. Just one more thing, Christoph. I think we also have to be accountable for the thing that we are accountable for as human beings. So. You have your genome, that's the hand that was played, playing the hand that has been dealt to us by biology. There's the exposome, the totality of an individual's exposures over a life course. And there's the behavome, that's the totality of an individual's behavior that mediate exposures of the exposome and, 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 and the genome. So only so much will be able to, I don't think we're accountable and, and the actionability is, 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 is a hundred percent there. Technology will help, but we're still by, you know, biologic beings. And, uh, I think, uh, you will never be able to eradicate that in, in, in some way. We're not going to evolve into disease free specimens anytime soon. No. Right. No, no, there's nothing slower than evolution, right? And we think with all the knowledge we have that, you know, we're, we're smarter than we've ever been, but we're not reinventing the wheel. There's not, there's not much change going on, right? And, uh, so just to close it up, I'm a health optimist, but I'm a behavioral realist. I would say never say never. I'm going to end it there. Aline, what's your take on it? So I agree with what you said. And I think like, yeah, diseases won't disappear. But we've also witnessed those, those past years, like in the, in the digital health ecosystem, healthcare ecosystem, like a swift, a shift. And uh, the, the patient, the, the consumers are more empowered, more, more in the center to take be better decision into their care, like self-care, like you were mentioning before. And through that, we are trying, they're trying to avoid these diseases by being more conscious, like being more aware of who they are, how that they can take better care of, of themselves. And I've seen a lot, so I collaborate quite a lot with uh, insurance companies. And insurance has really been focusing more and more on, on prevention, like they want to avoid diseases. Because for them, a customer who has like a chronic diseases advanced stage represents like a lot of economic, like a big economic burden for them. But if they can prevent that, if their customer can not be sick or be less sick, be, be treated at the beginning, it's positive for them. So we really seen them putting in place different initiatives, collaborating a lot with the technology companies, startup companies, offering self-care solution for the consumers to take better care of themselves and avoid those, those diseases. 
And also when I read your, your newsletter, something came to mind when we talk about technology, the concept of a digital twin, where we will make a digital representation of each of us. And the idea, like more you mentioned before, like genomics, like exome, that will represent the, the, the digital twin. And the idea is that every person will have a digital twin and we will follow the patient during all his life. And we can actually avoid diseases because we will know that the patient will get to disease before it happens. So yeah, that also came to mind. Interesting. Well, thank you for that discussion. I think, um, can I summarize it properly in saying that diseases will become somewhat less relevant, but they won't disappear? Is that correct? Yeah, I see everybody nodding. So again, thanks. Now let's move to the next segment of the Health Enthusiasm podcast. Is it something, nothing, or everything? So every month, one of the panelists brings an idea, an innovation, or an evolution forward that sparked their health enthusiasm. The rest of the panel will then debate and share their opinion about it. Do they find it something, nothing, or everything? And this month, by coincidence, both Mo and Aline, well, they suggested similar articles. So I'll leave the floor to Mo to explain it and then to Aline to launch this debate. Mo? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Christophe. So let's go back to 2012. There's a best-selling author and journalist called Michael Pollan, who's written a book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, that was at a dinner party at Berkeley and uh, California. He was among some uh, fellow diners. And one of the diners was a prominent psychiatrist in her 60s who spoke at some length about the fact that she recently made an LSD trip. And the journalist was, you know, his, it pricked up. Poland's ears and his first thought was saying, you know, how, you know, that's not, it's not good. How should a psychiatrist or well-renowned psychiatrist do take some LSD? And the psychiatrist went on to explain that the drug gave her a better understanding of the way children think. And her hypothesis was that the effects of psychedelics, LSD, so the, you know, that's what the topic is about, about psychedelics, gave her a taste of what child consciousness would be like, kind of a 360 degrees, taking it all in, but not really focusing on anything. He already heard about clinical trials in which doctors were giving cancer patients psilocybin to help them deal with their fear of death. And now he was really curious about the psychedelic therapy. And that curiosity became an article in the New Yorker. It's called The Treatment in 2015. And the article became a book, How to Change Your Mind. And that book now, has become a four-part Netflix docu-series that zooms in on the consciousness-expanding possibilities of various psychedelics and how researchers, psychologists, medical personnel are finding new uses for them. He also, in that series, personally partakes in all of the psychedelics he examines. Uh, he starts with LSDs, psilocybin, the shrooms, as they say, MDMA, and mescaline, and he discusses each effect on him. I don't know if you remember a few years ago, Gwyneth Paltrow also kind of assessed some unknown therapeutic things in, in, in the Goop Lab. And the reason why I wanted to address this is, is for, for several reasons. It's a very strong case of how the power of mainstream media is able to reverse some historic evolutions. You know, I'm talking about the ban of LSD by Nixon and rekindle the interest of science, the industry and the public in these forgotten or banned substances. For me, it completely changed my perspective on these substances. But most of all, I was dazzled by the long-term benefits that just one or two treatments with a psychedelic substance can have on one's quality of life and mental condition. Specifically, if we look at LSD, after no official research in humans in the last 40 years because it was banned by the U.S., because you know the reason behind it is that the youngsters weren't ready to be mobilized for the Vietnam War. And Nixon says, you know, let's ban LSD because otherwise, you know, we won't be able to mobilize them for the Vietnam War. And I, and I need more more soldiers for the Vietnam War. So that it was banned. And Switzerland picked it back up, the research. So after 40 years of silence in, in that clinical research, it is now recognized and included in brain research in the treatment of of alcohol abuse in anxiety associated, uh, associated terminal illnesses and treatments of headache disorders specifically. And that's incredible. I don't know if you've ever heard of cluster headaches, right? They also call it the suicide headaches. People, 
people would rather die than experience that. So it has been reported to abort attacks to decrease frequency and intensity of attacks and to reduce remission in patients suffering from cluster headache. I'm aware that despite Poland systematically depicting the potential of these substances in control situation with expert or experienced specialist, it might have the danger of triggering some of us to go experimenting with the self proclaimed experts and entrepreneurs because once it's out there, people see business and potential. And then we've seen it with CBD, right? Oils being sold with nothing in it. <laughs> so there is a danger to this, but I think it's an opportunity and it's an interesting way of how pharma and the industry is now being triggered into researching and, and investing back again in the in the medical use of these psychedelics and trying to help a lot of people who struggle with a lot of mental diseases and have a very, very low quality of life. So I was really enthusiastic by that. It triggered my intention, my interest. And um, that's something I wanted to share, how mainstream media was able to rekindle these things and, and make them publicly more available for everyone. So do you find it something, nothing or everything, Mo? I think it's definitely something. The mechanism is everything. So psychedelics, you know, the medical value of psychedelics is something. But the fact that mainstream media is able to, you know, give a counterforce to things that have been abolished or anything else, I think is everything. Yeah. Okay, and I'll, we'll get to the to medical point of view by Aditi in a minute, and we'll definitely hear about Paul and how pharma is moving into it. But I want to hear from Aline because you you brought forward as well an article that um, that was touching upon the same topic. Exactly. So my view was a bit different from most. So I've been following psychedelics for for some years now because I really see like a potential, like more you mentioned for for treating diseases like mental health or eating disorders, etc. PTSD. And now there's, a, there's this article saying that some employers in the U.S. are actually offering, or they would like to offer psychedelic as a health benefit, not part of the package for the, the em employees. And um, so the thing, there's different, uh, different ideas there. So first, to offer that support to the employee, so it will be really assisted therapy. So someone will be here to accompany you in, in, in that process. And so that can help people to deal with their, their mental health issues. And they also say that they see it as a benefit for, for leaders in the companies because they said that the leaders with unresolved trauma can actually show those trauma in their uh, leadership styles. So by offering like psychedelic or ketamine-assisted therapy that will help those leaders deal with their, their, their trauma open them to new ideas and treat the, the employees and the people behind them better. I think that's a very interesting point. And I read also that some people, so that's the case of the assisted therapy, but some people are also taking it on their own, like my microdosing without any, any support. And they said that they go to work like that every day and it provides them like they feel like more more productive and they, they can work longer. So maybe for some empl employers that can be also a benefit for them to have their their employees being more focused and more 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 productive. When I heard you talk in the beginning of the year, you do this this annual thing where you were talking about your ten predictions, I believe, for the pharma industry. It was one of the ten predictions that you made was around these psychedelics and how important they may become for pharma. What is your take on the two articles that you just uh, heard? I believe, on the one hand, I would love to see more activity in this area. I think it's clearly showing its clinical benefits, the plasticity of the brain being somewhat adaptable as a result of this. But actually, I'm going to say that I am very pleased with our industry because we've not jumped aboard a kind of hype and overvaluation kind of situation that may have happened in the past with other sort of new treatments. I think that pioneers in these areas are taking a very clinically led, a very sensible, a very measured approach. They are obviously trying to differentiate themselves from the images of Woodstock from the 60s and 70s for obvious reasons. They are being very careful about what they say and actually not saying very much. And we're seeing some noises. My good friend uh, Kabir Nath, who was the CEO of Otsuka in, in the US, is now the CEO of Compass Pathways, a, a company dedicated to uh, psilocybin. And we're seeing 
very sort of phased rollout, very slow, deliberately slow rollout. I actually contrast this sometimes to big tech. I think that, um, and, uh, you know, we look up to big tech in, in big pharma because we think it's cool and they, they love to hack and they love to move fast and break things. But I think that big tech should actually learn a little bit more from pharma and to move a little bit slower and a little bit more sensibly. And we all know what the sort of negative effects of social media have been, uh, particularly on young people. So I like the fact that we're taking this slow and steady and it's not becoming as fast as we, we might have thought it might when we, when we first started seeing some of the incredible clinical trial results that have been emerging. So yes, it's all good, but I'm happy with the pace. And just like um, Mo said, I think um, it's something, but the the way in which the media is handling it is everything. I mean, pharma has a pretty illustrious history. Merck scientists invented MDNA, MDMA, ecstasy. We've got you know a lot of <laughs> credentials, you could almost say, in the creation of and um, the refining of a lot of the the substances that we see. Then, of course, it was mass media that took it another way. And of course, we're now seeing mass media uh, take it back to perhaps a more sensible place, believe it or not. So that is an incredibly interesting system. And of course, we can influence it too. Yeah, I hear you say that um, we look up way too much to big tech and that maybe we should slow things down and that big tech might be learning from pharma or from healthcare in general. I think that is exactly your opinion as well, Aditi, or am I wrong? So I agree I, with the Paul said about how the pace of clinical trials and the way that people are using it, it makes a big difference because in general, healthcare is slow to move. Medicine is slow to change. There's a quote, it takes about 10 years from something to be proven useful for it to make it into general medical practice everywhere. And, you know, these are substances that were, you know, illegal for a lot of time. And so the way that they're doing this slowly with the clinical trials really showing great effects, I think makes a big difference in how people are talking about it. It's not something that they can just ignore. Um, you know, I will say, so we, we've used ketamine for a long time in the hospital, not for this. And so that is one medication that has already had a medical use. The rest of them haven't. What I'm curious, though, and I'm interested to see about what's going to happen is how it's actually rolled out. Right. So you have now that it's very, very, people are very careful, right? It's under a therapy or your psychiatrist. You have to have certain criteria and you get treated for it. But, um, you know, if they want to roll it out in a more significant way, like we're talking about with uh, companies or offices, that may not, maybe they will be able to do that in the future. But I just don't think that's going to be very quick either. So, you know, just recently, just this week, actually, there is a telemedicine company called Peak, which uh, supplied ketamine, and they got in a little bit of trouble, um, and they have to actually shut down. But not because they were necessarily doing anything illegal, but the way they went about marketing it, it just didn't work. It's probably just too early for it, and it's just not accepted. So I think with when we, when we try to take things that are not what we don't consider medicine, it works, you have to be very careful in how you do it. Because in the end, this is still used mostly recreationally. And while people argue that it's safer than a lot of other recreational drugs, at least in the class of medications, or excuse me, the class of drugs we're talking about, it doesn't mean there's no side effects at all, right? And so we have to just be careful in how we're going to be rolling it out, how we talk about it. And so I, I do agree that the slow pace is great. And it is... Honestly, it's how medicine works as well. We're talking about pharma, but that's how medicine works as well. And this is why sometimes we do it that way. I think this is something. I fully agree. And I think I would go for everything, not because it is there and we're ready, but because there is an, an overall trend. There are m multiple trends out there that sort of make this type of solutions, if I may call them that way, very tempting. And also for, for business, it makes it very tempting to sell it and even market it in, in particular ways. And I'm just quickly going to drop a couple of these, um, of these trends that I've noticed that makes the whole psychedelics market very tempting for business. Um, is that it's, first of all, you have this evolution versus towards more, you know, plant based solutions. Even from a medical point of view, we're looking into what are plant based solutions that we can, we can start using depending on the severity of the disease, of course. But plant-based solution is definitely something that's coming up. Superfoods has been mentioned for the past 10 years increasingly as well. 
But those are the two smaller trends. I think that the two biggest trends that I see that, that makes this entire evolution of psychedelics very interesting is, first of all, the evolution regarding experiences. What we've seen in the past years is that what we experience in life is becoming more important than what we have in life. And so people are looking for experiences. That why, that's, that's why people go to festivals. That's why people go on specific trips. They want, they want to climb the Kilimanjaro. What we've seen in recent years, the last, I would say, maybe 24 months, is that we are looking for exper- experiences that are more internally. So we're looking for ways to alleviate our, our minds because it helps also in the, the everyday stressors and the everyday challenges that we have in life. And so you see apps coming up that help with meditation, that help with subconsciousness, or at least getting into that state of sub- subconsciousness. And so this focus on internal experiences is becoming very attractive for businesses because people are interested increasingly in it. And there's a second big trend that I see happening that definitely plays into the, this evolution as well, and that is going back to the ancient solutions, maybe the older solutions, back to nature. I often call it the newly new age. We are looking at old Chinese medicine again. We are looking at rituals from the Maya cultures to help manage our health. And again, they're not medical. I know we had a lot of discussion about psychedelics and medical environment, but what I'm talking about is that people, when they're managing their health, they are moving away from the classical medicine and are looking to other types of solutions. Like we talked about going to uh, museums or doing walks in nature, or perhaps even using ancient culture to manage your health. And I think it just perfectly fits in that as well. And that's why I would say it is everything because it's so important in society, but we are not there yet. We are clear about that. So for now, maybe time for something else, because in this health enthusiasm world, and we see the boundaries of industries blurring between the worlds of healthcare, wellness, and consumer businesses. And you can see that the consumer businesses are slowly moving into wellness and the healthcare space, while the healthcare industry is paying more attention to what is happening outside of their industry. And this brings the following questions. What behavior, innovation, or trend from one industry can be worthwhile for another industry? In other words, what should we bring inside out or outside in? So I'll be bringing the topic up this time, and I want to talk about Netflix. If you've been on my website before, if you've read my newsletters, I often say that Netflix has turned into some sort of health company, but I'm not going to talk about that. Mo already mentioned that there's a docu-series on psychedelics on Netflix, but I'm not going to talk about that either. We already we already covered that. Um, I want to talk about the culture at Netflix. The co-founder of Netflix is Reed Hastings, and he wrote a book called, called No Rules Rules. Now, I'm notoriously known for not liking rules very much, but I really liked this book or the idea behind the book because it's, I think it's challenging. And maybe I was wondering and I wanted to hear from the panel, maybe there's some learnings in there for the healthcare industry. And so the basic idea is that, and within the book, is that the world is changing super fast. It's hard to keep up pace with that as a business. Uh, And basically, as a business, it's, you're in a real danger if you cannot really Keep up that pace. And definitely when you are working in a culture where people are afraid to make mistakes, people are afraid to lose focus if they're looking at the outside world. And so what Netflix has done is they entirely shifted their culture, or basically from the beginning, because Reed Hastings had a business before that almost went bankrupt because there were too many rules. So he wanted to apply the least least possible rules in his company. And so he basically put in place a decentralized decision-making and I would say a not pyramid, typical pyramid hierarchical structure. But he approaches the business as a tree where the, the founder, the leader is in the roots and the actual business is happening in the branches and in the leaves. And what he says is that as a business leader, you need to provide the freedom to the branches to grow, to grow in the direction that they want towards the sun, because that's, this is where you can actually grow and actually have enough nutrition to grow as an overall tree or business. And so what he says is that forget about the rules. If we want to innovate in this fast pacing world, As a company, as a leader, you need to put out context more than rules. You need to have the frameworks and the tools, but you don't need to tell people what to do. 
So forget about the rules, just provide them context and create a culture of freedom and responsibility so that we can innovate as is necessary in the world today. Aline, what's your take on this? Should we take it inside healthcare and how should we do it? So when you were saying that, when I, when I read the article, I was thinking about the, the patient and the role that we can have, especially like choosing the healthcare professionals in our care team, I would say. Like in France, for instance, you're assigned a primary doctor and then the doctor, you need to go and see your doctor for him to assign you to a, a, a specialist. And then you go back to your primary doctor to get the results and go and see some, someone else. And maybe I like to have more, more, more freedom and to, to decide myself. Maybe I want to see that, that specialist in the US was much better. I want to see the best, the best in, in class. So maybe that's what I was thinking that to have more power as, as a patient to choose. Yeah. Who would be my, in my care team. That's interesting. I was always looking at it from a, an, an, a healthcare institution point of view, but never as for, from a healthcare system point of view where you as a patient could have more freedom indeed. Paul, I see you nodding. What's your thought on this? Uh, yeah, just nodding because I also hadn't thought of it from a system point of view, but of course a system perspective is pretty vital. We tend to be a little bit insular in our thinking and only see what's immediate. I may as well ask the question while I'm, uh, answer the question while I'm here though. As you may know, I tend to spend most of my time these days in the halls of Big Pharma. And Big Pharma is obviously an industry that has existed in most cases for over a century and thus has a fairly traditional and set way of doing things. It's what they know how to do. At the same time, it's an industry that recognizes that it's going to become no more than a supplier if it doesn't do more than just make medicine. So, of course, it has to change. Now, what's the best way of creating that change? Is it to take the rules away, rules that have obviously protected the industry, protected patients for many, many years? I think that we have to subscribe to the rules of agility. Agility is, on the one hand, letting the market decide rather than using our kind of experience and expertise. We're not Julius Caesar where we can give a thumbs up or a thumbs down anymore to projects or, or ideas. We have to let the market decide. So on the one hand, that is taking away the rules. It's taking away the systems, taking away this, you know, the opposite of the tree is a kind of typical office block where you've got the leaders in the C-suites up in the, the roof, you know, the fancy offices at the top and everyone else underneath closest to, uh, you know, furthest away from the sun. So we need to get away from that. On the other hand, to do agility well, you need rules. You need, for example, accountability from the outset. You need to know what you're actually trying to measure and trying to do. Because if you don't set that metric up, if you don't know what you're trying to get to, you'll never become a learning organization. You'll never be able to determine if you're actually going the right way and the, the market is rewarding you, therefore, or if you're going the wrong way and you'll therefore make bad decisions. Agility, of course, is about making fast, iterative decisions based on the market uh, appreciation of what you're doing. So I think that question is very nuanced. I'm not a big proponent of what Reed Hastings is saying for the pharmaceutical industry. I don't think you can just take the rules away. I think that you need a different set of rules, a new management system, if you like, to be able to make this work. Yeah, and I kind of fully agree with you. I think it's hard to, to, to let go of the rules entirely, but we need to have a new set of rules. And I think what Roche is doing right now, I don't know if you recently worked with Roche, but they have completely flipped their own entire organization upside down. And two days ago, I was talking to um, the GM from France where they explained that they have no sales function anymore. They have no marketing function anymore. They just are organized around patient pathways where they are asking physicians, what do you need? And then we will provide it. So it's a, the entire thing upside down, a, a, a way more agility and a new set of rules with actually less rules because they don't have any sales uh, figures anymore. So they don't know how much they're selling. They also don't have to ask for budget. They don't do any annual plans anymore. 
They just ask for the budget when the moment arrives and when they need it. So um, definitely agile and with far less rules and far more. One of the, the first examples, examples that I've seen for sure. But let's maybe go to the medical side of things. Aditi, what's your point on it? So I agree a lot with Paul, right, from in, inside healthcare systems and institutions or medicine in general. You can't get rid of the rules entirely. But obviously there has been a lot of harm from the hierarchical system that has been existing for forever. And there's a real, there's been a real recognition, a real um, change in trying to get more patient views, making sure there's care collaboration with other team members. That's all uh, helpful. But, you know, we're talking about innovation specifically. And so when we're, we're talking about that, yes. So you want to have every voice that might be affected by whatever you're creating to have a a seat at the table, whether it's for a health system creating an innovation project, we used to do that all the time, or even a startup, right? You have to know the exact population that you're serving. And that takes some time. That takes a, a figuring out what uh, you're looking for. Because if you don't, what ends up happening is that within health systems, you know, you might have all these smaller groups creating their own innovations. Maybe they're using a certain platform. They've decided to try out a certain device. And then what ends up happening is that there's no centralized place. And then you have seven contracts. And so when you're trying to actually do something at a larger level, it becomes very difficult. So in that way, there still has to be some centralized way. But the way you described um, the no rules rules, where there's still somebody at the root, but everybody else has the branches, I think that makes sense when you're trying to innovate in such a large system, because it does need some structure and it does need those rules for sure. Yeah, I think we we saw this happening in healthcare institutions during the pandemic, when it was basically impossible to go through all the procedures before having or trying out something innovative, right? And I remember talking to a um, CEO of um, a hospital in Brussels, uh, Brussels, a university hospital in Brussels, who's been a, a CEO for about nineteen years there, and he is known, and his entire establishment is known as being very innovative. But he said that in the first four months of the pandemic, he saw more innovation than the 19 years that he has worked there, primarily because there were less rules and there was only the context that he was providing. So in that sense, um, I fully agree with you. There needs to be some centralized approach, but the idea of the branch and, um, and, and the roots is definitely, and providing that context is definitely one way of, um, of, of making it happen. I mean, it certainly works, necessity, but then... Oh, sorry. I was just going to say the, the necessity will work, but then the problem is six months after the pandemic started, a year after the pandemic started, then you're you're left with a lot of disparate arms and you're trying to figure out what you're going to do. So I think both are necessary. But yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And urgency always makes things happen, of course. Mo, the last word is for you. Yeah, really interesting. I really love the topic, Christoph. First remark is this, it's not because there's no rules that there are no principles. I think Netflix operates on principles less than rules. And as you said, it's the context, but do not be mistaken. The end target is excellence. And they're not afraid to part with anyone who's not able to dream up and push the organization forward. Secondly, I think pharma companies will still go where the business is. That means that governments have to redefine the business. So I think if governments redefine success, for instance, Aditi, Aditi, you are in remote care. We know that hospitals are mostly paid on service, right? So when a patient comes in, they get a fee. That means that often when people have, for instance, a device in their heart and they have a defibrillator or, or a heart rhythm regulator, they are scheduled on calendar based. They don't use the data that comes in to say, no need for you to come today right? Because then they would lose a fee. So the service-based versus outcome-based is something that is completely, you know, that we absolutely need to shift. And then I think if we want the pharma companies to move ahead, I think the government has to do their homework in the way they sponsor healthcare. And I know, Christophe, that you're always talking about sick care, but I think pharma companies will go where the governments go. And I think there's a really I think the biggest inertia is in is in government and the biggest problem we have is elections. <laughs> Why? Because it's about to change every three to four years. So how do you create continuity and that you don't end up in situations like Aditi said, three to four years after the, someone else comes in, changes the rules and there's no continuity. So um, I love, for instance, the Chinese principle where where an engineer has funded a bridge, he is 
liable for life for the quality of the bridge, even when he's not elected anymore. I think there's a lot of systems, and I love what, what Aline said, we need to think a level up governments, systems, how success is defined, and then the business will follow, I think. Thank you for that. I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting discussion. I, I, was, I was really thinking about healthcare institutions and how they manage rules. But we touched upon the healthcare system, and we even touched upon specific healthcare companies like Pharma. So thank you, everybody, for these uh, very smart words. And with this, I would like to wrap up the Healthy Season podcast for this month. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you like the show, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on your favorite podcast platform. By the way, you can also find us on the Shift Forward Health channel. It's a podcast channel of thought leaders who are actively designing and building the health and self-care business of tomorrow. For now, I'd like to thank our own thought leaders for their insights and health enthusiasm. Thank you, Aditi Joshi, Aline Noizet, Mozuina and our guest today, Paul Sims. My name is Christophe Choquet. We are the Health Enthusiasm panel, and we'd love to see you again next month for some more Health Enthusiasm. Ciao. Thanks for tuning in. If you like what you heard, please spread the word. Tell your colleagues to tune in for all the awesomeness, then leave a review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This show is produced by Shift Forward Health, the channel for changemakers. Subscribe to Shift Forward Health on your favorite podcast app, and you'll be subscribed to our entire library of shows. See our full lineup at shiftforwardhealth.com. One subscription, all the podcasts you need, and it's all for free. And remember, we might have a lot of work to do in healthcare, but we'll get there faster together. Thanks again.